Hey everybody, this is Kaylee McMahon. You know me already for number one Leading Ladies podcast where we work at, work on helping women to uplift each other instead of tear each other down. We have a very special guest today that I'm happy to see again. Uh, Denise, I'm going to let you introduce yourself because I won't do it justice. <laughs> Hi, my name is Denise Piazza. I have been investing in uh, real estate for um, over 10 years now, I am the one of the founding partners of um, One Street Capital. Um, my background is I'm a CPA by trade. Um, I started in public accounting, I guess, probably about 20 plus years ago. And when I first started, um, you know, in that in that position, I was preparing a lot of tax returns for several high net worth individuals. And um, one of the common denominators, one of the main common denominators that I saw when I was preparing those tax returns at the time was that there was uh, several real estate investments um, and, you know, real estate holdings. So I took a mental note of that because at the time I did not have the liquidity that I um, that I thought I needed to get started in investing in real estate. So, um, but I knew it was something that I needed to continue to grow my network in. Um, and so I still have relationships with a lot of the clients, um, a lot of the businesses that I worked with at the time. I, you know, took another role after several years there um, with a few Fortune 100 companies, worked my way up the ranks of the organizations, and then really uh, started the last decade or so investing a lot passively. And one thing that I did um, was that I, I tried to get exposure to a lot of different asset classes. So I invested in some triple nets, um, some commercial retail properties. Uh, my husband and I own an office building um, fully occupied. I always feel the need to say that because yeah. of COVID. Everyone's like, oh, you have an office building. It must be. No one must be there. Um, and, and multifamily and single family properties. So took the time to really um, <clears throat> test out, you know, the different assets, the different types of, um, you know, returns that you could see from various assets and then uh, really developed more of an, um, an appreciation and a passion for multifamily assets and, um, you know, grew, started to, started a company that was more focused on acquiring um, multifamily assets in a more of an active sense as opposed to just being a limited partner. Um, so, so, yeah, that's really how my journey started. And then I think what we're going to talk a little bit about today is over the past year or so, um, I've really tried to round out a lot of my you know, get continue to get more exposure to additional sources of passive income. And um, one way that I've done that, um, taken on additional sources, I've become an angel investor as well. So I think we're going to talk a little bit about that today. That would be lovely. Thank you so much for introducing yourself. And your story is really powerful because um, I think a lot of individuals out there uh, work their normal job and then don't spend the time to be able to even get exposure to what is available to them. Um, and luckily, I think through your last profession uh, or well, through your profession, you're able to see it. And you're like, oh, this makes sense. Um, right. Whereas most people that say, for example, do their first passive investment, they've never even felt like the mailbox money or they can see um, what happens. So I think it's a really great conversation, even when you want to know about how does this look on my balance sheet or what kind of right. returns are typical to talk to a CPA like they, they would know, you know, yep. so absolutely. I, I think that's genius. Yeah. And I think, you know, having, you know, one of my partners um, who was a, a mentor to me said to me that was so profound at such a young age and really stuck with me. He said, you know, keep in mind for all of these clients that we have, it's not about what they make it's about what they keep so obviously you know as a cpa we need to do it ethically but really um you know that that reshaped the way that i thought about everything going forward yeah. from that moment on i mean something so you know a, a phrase like that just really shifted my mindset um and then you know you start to realize that taxes are just such a, a key way in which you can really um retain more of your wealth 
Yeah, absolutely. So it sounds like you're a little bit more of an advanced professional in your industry where a lot of those that I've worked with in the past are not a tax strategist. Uh, so they can't kind of think ahead like that. So I think that's also something to talk to when you are getting involved with or you are already involved with real estate. Someone on your team like Denise, who is um, smart, proactive, and also understands what you're doing because she's doing it herself. You know, that's always a great, right. a great partner to have. Um, Denise, right. I've got a quick question for you that we always ask all of our guests. What would you say sure. has been your biggest win? Um, oh, that's a great one. Um, I would say my biggest win is um, a deal that I invested in passively that was not a big win necessarily, but it um, it reminded me, it, it actually taught me a very valuable lesson. So I invested in a, um, a real estate opportunity. Um, the the individual who was leading the team acquiring the asset it really you know his story really resonated with me um he had a strong financial background he you know the the financial metrics the pro forma all the numbers looked fantastic it was you know looked like it should be on paper a great deal um and you know i was like great well you know i'm gonna invest in this deal and at the time i didn't realize the importance of the team so and the ability for the team to execute um you know a lot of people and myself included because i'm i have a finance and accounting background you know you when you're looking at an opportunity you jump to okay how much am i going to make on on this opportunity and you really have to take the time to understand how that particular team is going to manage whatever asset you you know you're you're um investing in And so um, I think that that experience, again, was sort of a a game changer for me and how my mindset worked in that it's not just about, you know, what you're projecting to make. um, It's really how you execute the deal. Now, luckily, we, you know, we were able to still make money on that particular investment, but it was a scenario where the individual really never came close to, not never, but rarely came close to hitting the pro forma that they had um, budgeted out because there was just a lot of issues with how they were operating the asset. And um, luckily the market was able to bail them out, um, luckily for me and for them as well. Um, So it just really, and that was earlier on in my investing um, experience. So I would say that really changed the way um, I looked at deals and I was able to, you know, tap into my my network of other real estate investors and say, like, hey, you know, what are your thoughts on this? How do you how do you gauge this? Like, what are some you know ways that you can that you can um, make sure that you focus on the team? And then that's when I really um, started, you know, looking at my deals differently. And then ultimately, that's really what I look at it as a as such a win because ultimately it got me to the point where I wanted to start doing this on my own um, so that I could, you know, I would like to be more active in all the investments that um, that I do. So it just got me to the point where I was like, well, I think that I would like to start my own business centered on that. Yeah, that is a huge win. Um, I think. I will vouch that I've been through something similar personally a couple of times. And... Um, have learned the lesson that 100% it is the team. Right. Okay, so back to the biggest win, I'll vouch that 100%, I think sometimes you get the opportunity to gain a lesson, <laughs> um, even when things yes. are you know, not uh, ideal, right? So right. I echo that. Right. I hear you. Yeah, and you have to try to take you know, the, the experience um, you know, as, as frustrating and painful as some situations might be, I try to always take, um, that or whatever that, it, you know, something that you can take away from that experience is, uh, is key to being able to look past it. Absolutely. Now on that 
So you took something and flipped it, like said, let's take a challenge and turn it into an opportunity, right? So I think that frame of mind with everything in life is where I'm trying to, to be. So um, I love hearing that from you. Um, and I hope everybody out there listening and watching this later also, you know, when, when things that are happening that are scary, bad, you know, it's an opportunity. Um, but speaking of the flip side of things, what would you say has been your biggest lesson? Um, my biggest lesson has been um, that <clears throat> it's important to, um, you know, just be as transparent um, with your investors as possible um, and to get ahead of any sort of um, issues that you want to communicate to them, um, it, it, even if you're, you know, possible, even if there's a, a possibility for a situation to happen, I like to lay everything out and be very upfront about risks and rewards associated with each investment opportunity. And I think that creates a whole different level of trust with your investors because at the end of the day, um, you're in this for the long game and you're trying to build a business and it's critical that you um, have people that know that they can place their trust in you. So um, I'm very open and upfront about about, you know, what I, how I personally am evaluating um, an investment opportunity. And I try to pass all the information along to my investors as well so that they can look at it, um, you know, with all the uh, pros and cons associated with each opportunity. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I'll, again, echo that, too. I've been in both kind of par partnerships where, like, you know, the team knows th th things are not going well, but maybe I'm not the lead that gets to decide what our communication looks like. So I've learned right. from that. Um, but that, you know, even if it seems scary, you know, if at least we're talking about it, addressing it, we have a plan, yeah. we're communicating that to the investors. I mean, like, what else can we do? I mean, like, that's, right. that's it. Right. But if exactly. we don't tell them and then yeah. something surprise, you know, I 100% agree right. with you. 100%. Yes. And if you come to people with uh, presenting an issue and you have a plan in place to your point, it's it's a heck of a lot different story than like, you know, we're running into this. Um, there might be this possibility of, of, of something happening, but, you know, we're going to address it. But you have to have something laid out explaining exactly how you're going to address it. Yeah, 100%. Um, so we're on the same page there. And I hope that anyone that's listening, this applies, I think, to any business. You know, I've learned that whether it's uh, warehousing or whether it's, you know, multifamily passive investments or whether it's like your, whether your team, you have like venture capital partners or whether you have general partner partners or you have limited partners or um, uh, a JV partner or all kinds of different structures. I've just found that, you know, when we can all kind of come to the table and uh, whoever is involved gets the opportunity to be able to know what's going on. I think that uh, that's like the best, best method. And I echo what you're saying, Denise, all day long, <laughs> all day long. So those are pretty much like the questions that we ask. Um, actually one that I totally skipped over, which is like the first thing that we actually normally ask. Um, yeah. because let's let, let's hit it now because there's a couple of answers you may have because you have so much knowledge and experience in different things that are related. Um, however, right. I'm sure as an entrepreneur, each one of those ventures looks different. So uh, the question we normally ask when we come on the show is wanting to show other women that when they want to get into investing or when they want to start a business or let's particularly talk about starting a business, a lot of people out there say, oh, you know, you get to take the time off that you want whenever you want. You know, you uh, it, it looks like this freedom thing that is not reality. And so in reality, what did that look like for you starting your own business? Uh, whichever one you want to talk about is up to you. But like, you know, were you like me where you had to take a loan out on a credit card for your first, you know, basically business sure. startup expenses, move back in with mom and dad? Like, how did that look? And then what did it take to go from that place to traction where you're like, oh, people actually have a demand for this and we're going to charge money for it and scale? Right. Right. So I would say that um, for me, the uh, most important um, piece of getting started um, as with my own business and as an entrepreneur is to tapping into my discipline and my hustle. So I um, had a full-time job, have um, two children, a husband, um, and you know a demanding uh, demanding life all around. And so when people say, "Oh, you know, I want to do this, but I don't have the time," I 
I challenge people to question that and reevaluate and think about everything you do throughout the day and um, figure out a way if it's something that you're passionate about and that you want to do, figure out the time. Because if I can do it, then uh, so can everyone else. Uh, you just have to really be disciplined about it and you have to be passionate. If you don't, if it's not something that you love to do, um, there's going to be a million and one excuses not to do it. So make sure it's something that you're extremely passionate about that you want to do and just go for it because um, you will find the time if you, um, if you, you know, analyze, like, as I said, what you're doing throughout the day. Um, <clears throat> so I would say the biggest challenge getting started for me was just how much work it is and it continues to be. And I don't mind that. Um, that's my personality. I don't do um, what we do for purposes of um, time freedom. I, I, that's not necessarily for me. Um, I, I can completely respect people that would like more of that in their life. I think for me, it's more just about flexibility and, um, you know, how, where I want to be, when I want to be doing it, um, physically where I want to be doing it, um, basically. And I think that, you know, it will, um, open up doors, but I also realize that as an entrepreneur, you might think you're going to be working less, but that's not probably, that's probably not realistic, um, when it comes down to it. Um, but it's work, doing something that you are in control of. You're working to accomplish your dream as opposed to if you're in a W-2 position that um, you're not necessarily driving it, that you know, you're know you not working to accomplish somebody else's uh, mission and, and dream. So that's, that's the way, that's what keeps me going and keeps me motivated um, and keeps me working towards it. For those of us who um, have never scaled a company or maybe don't have a technical background or a financial background or a business degree, and I'll vouch for myself in the beginning of not having that kind of a background, not knowing like, where do I go get the templates to be able yep. to create KPIs or where do I get the um, the ideas of how to organize, direct, and um, work with the team, um, leadership as far as laying out to everyone what is the common goal, enrolling people right. in that idea. Uh, and that was a self-limiting belief for a long time where I went very small in like my investment career because I was yeah. like, there's no way I could organize a big project. What would you say to kind of overcome something like that? Or what were you able to do to overcome that? Yeah, I would say two things, education and mentors. So find people that have done what you would like to do and uh, tap into them as a resource and, you know, figure out a way that you can add value to them. Don't just come with it one sided, add value in any way that you can. And everybody, you know, can has skill sets that they can bring to the table um, that they can utilize and, um, you know, use them. And just the experience alone is going to. Um, just be such in such an incredible education over that um, over that time period that you're working with a mentor, and then just the other piece of it being education. I mean, there's, I mean, we all know the power of of podcasts like this one, and um, how much wealth of information is out there um, via podcasts on YouTube. There's you know endless amounts of books um, on finance and you know things that you can if you aren't comfortable. With, your, uh, with investing in certain areas, there's always a book, um, there's always an article, there's always a podcast, there's always educational materials out there that you can tap into. And, um, but, you know, the one word that you mentioned, Kaylee, um, during that is, you know, your mindset. And I think it really does start with mindset. And th that's one thing, luckily, that I've always had going for me there's never been something that I thought um you know well I can't I can't do that you know I, I it's too big for me I I'm completely unqualified I just tell myself you know even if I am unqualified and you know starting a new hobby or whatever it is you know no one no one was born with that particular skill set I'm going to work at it I'm gonna practice I'm gonna you know tap into other people who've done it and I'm going to do whatever it takes to, to get it done. So I think you really just have to ha come with that particular mindset. And it's, it, it's, you know, not always natural, but there are definitely exercises that you can take to work on your mindset to get there. And it sounds like you've already 
you've already uh, done so yourself. So I think it's, um, I think that's great. One thing that I'll vouch for that has really changed, you know, I used to, okay, so I started in single family. I started in leasing and then got to single family. And I mean, just, it's a different trajectory for everybody, right? But yep. definitely, definitely the mindset wasn't there. And the one thing that turned it around was uh, getting off it. So me realizing and admitting to myself that I cannot do everything <coughs> myself, regardless of yep. if you're in multifamily or if you're in single family, either way, like you, you need other people to do things with you. So you gotta like kind of sure. get off it, get off the ego. Uh, and, then, yep. and then number two, be able to ask for help. And then number three, having a community. Like that has been the biggest, so in that step order for me, whether how quickly you find that or yeah. however long it takes. Once you have that community of people that are similar to you, a hundred percent, you know, it's like, like a skyrocket yeah. up. So don't be yeah. afraid to join a group that is trying to accomplish the same thing that you are. You'll likely have some people in there that are more experienced than others. And that's a great thing to have, uh, having yeah. tools and, um, having, um, having tools basically shared with the group is another great way to be able to have access to things that, you know, I didn't necessarily have to go back to school to get a business degree or right. um, something that, you know, when you are in a lead position, when I've done small things, I'll say that it's, it was, my mindset was that I didn't need to do certain trainings or someone told me to go get a CCIM um, in the beginning. Yep. I never did that because I was like, well, the property manager has that. Why do I need that? Now it makes a little bit more sense. Um, I just find other partners that have that, but bigger to me in any business, and this will apply for the rest of your life, whether you're doing investments or not, um, is really going to go get a, a, an accounting certificate. I mean, that's one thing a business owner told me, you know, he's like, you've got to be able to know cash flow in, cash flow out daily, like yeah. how to go look at things and be able to tell when something's off so you can catch it early yeah. and then avoid right. the disaster. And I was so afraid as a, as a, as a woman is, is honestly what I'll say, because as a, as a kid and growing up, I tried to avoid math all day long. I'm not good at math. I'll never be good at math. And I didn't, yeah. I didn't go to school. And I, every time my degree did more math, I went the other way. Like I did something yeah. else. And right. I, um, I, I hope that those listening and, and watching know how important that is, whether you're not, de I'm not detailed, I'm not, I hate it, but it is absolutely crucial to be able yeah. to like look at things and know what you're looking at and be right. able to, to pivot, you know, you know, when necessary. So they're like the SBA, I'll just say this out loud, they have a class that's like 1500 to $2,000 or something like that. And then you basically get a mini accounting degree to where you'd be able to know what is going on in your business, you know, so. Yeah. And, and you're doing it at a different point in your life, right? I mean, so a lot of people, when they're when we're taking classes like that, yeah. we're typically younger. I mean, we have a different level of maturity. We have a different mindset. So I think no matter what, it's such a good idea to, to revisit it, even if you had it previously. And it's never too late to, to learn those concepts because they are, I agree, they're so critical. They're just a foundation for so many, for any business, really. Yeah, so you don't want to be subject to being taken advantage of, you know. So, so for me, a gender bias of I'm not good at math then ends up resulting in being taken advantage of financially because of not right. taking care of yourself, knowing how financials work. I mean, it's, it's up to you to be able to take care of yourself that way and make sure that your partners and yourself are taken care of and not taken advantage of. Now, one quick thing I wanted to go over, uh, we've got a couple of minutes. Um, so we mentioned earlier on in the podcast that there's some cool things that you're involved with that are things I don't know anything about. So selfishly, I want to know, um, yeah. what, what is it like being um, an angel investor? What got you into that? And how does that work as far as creating a passive income stream? Sure. So um, an angel investor is um, a lot of people equate it to the show Shark Tank. Um, so people um, with various, um, you know, different within different industries, we have um, I'm part of a group and that particular group interviews different um, different companies that are at early stages. So before anything, before the Series A funding um, these folks typically, you know, have started the business on their own through their own capital or maybe have one or two other partners and they've been able to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry, um, scale their business quickly and they are looking for additional funding to continue to scale it and take it to the next level. So what happens is we have um, a committee. So I'm sorry. Before that, we will have people that will recommend, um, based on their experience with other individuals, they'll recommend these groups to come in and to 
essentially pitch us on their company, explain to us <coughs> their missions, their values, what they what they do. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Um, and then to go through what their plan is, what they plan to do with their funding, what their financials look like, <coughs> their pro forma, how they've um, come about their valuation, their, their potential valuation of their company, and what um, metrics they've used to um, to judge its performance over the, the life of its exi- existence. Um, and really just, you know, explain to us what they're doing, why it's going to make an impact and how they're going to use this funding to scale their company um, so that, you know, we will want to invest as a group. Um, Very cool. And then our group will then review the, the materials and then we will form a due diligence committee to um, vet in more detail all of the information that um, the that the owner or CEO has provided. And um, that based on that due diligence committee, (coughs) (coughs) sorry, Um, we'll make a recommendation about whether or not we want to continue to pursue. (coughs) Yeah, so let me expand, let me expand a little bit on there. you know, <laughs> so, um, so in there, um, so for people like me who maybe have never heard about this before, um, I actually ended up taking an accelerator uh, during uh, the lockdown that was in New York City. And I'm not saying that anyone has to do this. I try to give these uh, templates and resources to our community of, of women that we have. Uh, because, you know, not all of us have to go through it to be able to understand it. But one of the biggest mind blocks that I had of being able to uh, get in front of a bank, get in front of a angel investor, a venture capital company, whatever it is that would be providing funding for your next uh, stage of growth is being fundable. So that's something, again, kind of going back to the lack of the background in accounting, um, where I didn't understand that you had to basically have your company uh, very clearly outlined in a way where you could show the different profit sources, where they're coming from. And for example, the systems related to them, if that were to be given $10, whatever it is, then we could now do 10 times the amount of production. Uh, Therefore, the people that invest could then have a certain percentage of the proceeds and then they are able to make income that way. And they don't necessarily have to do all the heavy lifting that the founders are doing. Um, but being able to select those companies is difficult. So being clear with, you know, where you're at financially and where you're going, one thing that we've used is live plan uh, to be able to plug in where we're at and then track that because as you keep earning or changing your income streams or doing different things, you have to keep editing it. But um, sure. I also didn't understand as a, as a founder in the beginning that I'm like, well, wait a sec, you can't just like start a business and like make up numbers, you know what I mean? But yeah, you can, that's actually how it works. And so uh, you either have a business yeah. that has some basic income and you can track the percentage of where it comes from and, and whatnot. Um, or like I'm looking to open a warehouse in that situation, I do not have one open right now, but we know what the cost of materials are. We know what it costs to store it there. We have the market, uh, to market numbers essentially for all of those metrics and what is normal profit margin for that type of business. What is normal, um, equipment costs to go into the business, all that kind of stuff can be just basically researched and put into, in my example, live plan to be able to show it to a group like yours to say, hey, we're fundable because of this. I never understood any of that stuff being so shied away from finances for so long. Um, So is that something that helps you to evaluate what you're interested in is something like that? Yes, I mean, it it certainly does. Um, The one, the other, you know, it helps me to evaluate that, but also the other thing that has been um, so instrumental in my growth from being a part of that group is just really thinking about your sphere of influence, the people that you're in the room with on a regular basis and going back to um, never, the concept of never being the smartest one in the room. Um, And I think that has really helped me to grow um, from my investment skill set because a lot of the folks that I work with in that um, in that particular group have very diverse backgrounds. A lot of them are entrepreneurs. Um, they've you know started their business from scratch, and you know one of they have one of very many skill sets, and I've been able to reap the benefits of that. 
That is incredible. Um, and so I'm really excited to have you on here to just talk about kind of what that means as far as getting involved with uh, investing in other ventures um, and being able to talk about like even a due diligence committee. Again, like that's something that I had no idea how that worked. I just remember reading online like, oh, at some point in your business, you can go to these things called angel investors and maybe they'll want to invest. And like that was the level of understanding. And so, but it's like, how do you, how do you bridge that gap? Another couple of terms that I heard that were not familiar to me a long time ago was the round of funding, for example. So one thing that I'm familiar with now is uh, pre-seed, seed, seed um, series A, uh, and different series of, of funding. So um, I don't remember the name of the platform, but whenever someone invests into like a VC, venture capital company, invests into another business, there is a, um, it's AngelList. No, it's not. There's there's a website online that lists out all of the different investments that have come from which companies online, and and that's all new information to me. Um, but again, sphere of, sphere of impl- influence. Like maybe for example, somebody that invests in Boxable. Like I found her in Austin, you know, and so I'm like, oh, so she cares about mission driven um, companies, right? So that would be someone right. to figure out what is that person's sphere of influence. Maybe they won't invest in my company, but maybe they know those that will. Maybe they know um, how to do the correct type of marketing that you need or, or whatever that connection is. So there's so much more, like you said, Denise, to um, getting your business to that next uh, series or next round uh, funding funding round. Um, what would you say about a company that's in a pre-seed or seed level? What um, what stage are they in as far as ideas, um, numbers? What would you see in that stage? I would see um, just you know very high level uh, information, like a lot of ideas, a lot of testing. Um, maybe they've proven it within a small. They've proven their concept within a small subset of a market. Um, and they they do have you know very basic financials. Um, it might not be for an extended period of time, typically a year or less. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's still so much good to to come from that level of pre seed and um, so much experience to gather. Just the way that individuals' mind works and how they start tapping into other people that they need uh, you know you mentioned even with real estate it just goes back to the same concept of a team so that individual that owner isn't going to be able to do everything on his own or her own so basically they're going to um, have to tap into other folks around them to um, help bridge those gaps yep 100 percent well denise thank you so much for your time on number one leading ladies today it was really cool to be able to talk about several different areas uh, where businesses are created where they're funded what does the picture of being an entrepreneur really look like um and also going through your journey of um growing the or expanding the growth of the understanding of what is available because i think that um that that's how we're going to get to success is, is growing that understanding of what we need to get it accomplished which is always other people <laughs> always yes, other people absolutely absolutely yeah yeah so thank you for for taking the time thank today you. it's good to see your face again and all those who are watching yes. listening and reading later to number one leading ladies uh please make sure to share like and to comment on this episode we really appreciate your support and being able to get these stories in front of other women what it really takes to be an entrepreneur and to lift each other up while we're doing this thank you denise thank you thank you so much